welcome to Coronavirus Capitalism, a special podcast series from the Socialist Party. In the coming days and weeks, we'll be talking about the unfolding crisis sparked by COVID-19, the novel virus at the centre of the most serious social health emergency in generations. We'll analyse the turmoil besetting the capitalist system, with businesses in many sectors as well as major airlines going bust, and thousands of workers losing their jobs and losing pay. We'll examine the measures taken by governments nationally and internationally in response to the spread of the virus and the threat it poses to their economic system. We'll be asking the most important questions. What does this mean for working class people? And how do we make sure that we aren't made to pay the price? We're joined over Skype by Pat Lawler. Pat is a health worker and a NIPSA representative. NIPSA is the largest public sector trade union in Northern Ireland and has a membership of over 43,000 public sector workers. Hi, Pat. Hi, Eleanor. We're also joined by Daniel Waldron, who is a member of the Socialist Party National Committee. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Eleanor. And we have Karis Falvey. Karis is a member of the Socialist Party and an activist with Rosa, the Socialist Feminist Movement. Hi, Karis. Hi, Anna. So because of the outbreak of COVID-19, we're faced with the scenario of patients needing to be hospitalised and needing intensive care in numbers that far exceed the surge capacity of the NHS. We've seen some truly horrific scenes in Italy with patients being turned away from hospitals, including some who are critically ill, uh, some people dying alone in overcrowded wards, and convoys of army trucks transporting coffins to cremation sites. Pat, is the health service ready to face this crisis? Well, I have to say, uh, as a health service worker uh, working in the acute sector, unfortunately, the simple answer to that is no. Um, Now, there's a number of very obvious reasons for that. Uh, One of the key reasons for that is that we've had a long history uh, a decade or more of health cuts, uh, unfortunately, going back, as I say, more than 10 years. And with that in itself, we're seeing uh, major understaffing, uh, which is at a chronic, le- a chronic level. I mean, we've seen, uh, it's well known uh, uh, throughout uh, the community in Northern Ireland, uh, where, where the staffing levels have reached such a, such a point where we have waiting lists that are just astronomical, going over 18 months to two years for people to wait, even for the simplest of of procedures. So even at that point, uh, at this moment in time, where we now see the pandemic beginning to surge in Northern Ireland, uh, and we are unfortunately we're seeing deaths now, uh, we are expecting a, a real problem within our health service. And one of that part of that problem will be in reality, the capacity to look after the potential uh, patients that, that we are expecting. Um, it's well known uh, that we clearly don't have enough ICU beds, and we certainly don't have enough ICU machinery, which would help those patients like ventilators approximately. And, and again, this has been recorded in the media. There's approximately 80 to 100 uh, ICU beds, which would be ICU ventilators, in use at any one time across Northern Ireland, most of them will be most of them will be based in the regional hospital, uh, regional hospitals in Belfast, and also with that there isn't enough specialist nurses, ICU nurses who would be there to look after them. And this is a fundamental issue, you know, uh, because it takes three to four years to train a nice train a nurse up to qualifying, and then there's specialist training on top of that. Uh, to make them experienced ICU nurses with with what is required. And also the medics on top of that as well. Obviously, they have their five years and then they have to have further years of training to become senior uh, senior doctors uh, working in those areas. And we have had a real problem with recruitment, a real problem with training. You cannot just, you know, you can't cut these professionals out of the hedges. You can't make these up uh, and magic them out of into existence. 
So we've we have a real chronic shortage in relation to that, and and that's going to be, and that's that's our first problem. What is clearly also what is becoming more and more apparent, and it's, and I'm getting contacted on a regular basis, on a daily basis, is actually the lack of equipment to deal with this pandemic at source in the hospitals in the acute environment. So one of the key issues is the what we call the PPE, which is the personal protective equipment, and effectively the main the main piece of equipment there is is the mask. Now there's a number of different types of masks that they do a number of different types of things, but in relation to this type of virus, which is a droplet transmission of virus, it, it's carried in droplets of water. Um, unfortunately, what you need is a is what we call a PP3 mask, which is a respirator mask. Um, which protects not only obviously the person wearing it, but obviously protects anybody else in your it, it surroundings. And those are 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 a very short supply. There is, I mean, today even today, I'm getting phone calls from nurses and from healthcare professionals uh, who are ask who are, are raising serious concerns, asking real questions that there isn't enough of these uh, available. Um, so we are having real problems. We're really behind the curve on this and and trying to get ahead of it. Uh, and we're very concerned as healthcare professionals about that. This fundamentally comes back to the, the key point within the health service. Is it ready? And it does come back to the key issues of how our health service has been chronically underfunded for many, many years. Uh, we have seen cuts of millions of pounds uh, from our health service over many years through the assembly, Westminster and assembly budgets. While in some regards, we have uh, crocodile tears from some of our assembly uh, parties about defending our health service, these were the people who unfortunately uh, applied those budgets and, and, and we are seeing the impact of those cuts today. So I think uh, we are very concerned uh, in relation to how this has is, is, is run out. And I think this is the future uh, at this moment in time, unless something serious is done to intervene to change it. I think that Pat's given a good picture there of the crisis which exists. I mean, if you look back uh, you before this pandemic developed, last year the waiting times in A&Es in Northern Ireland quadrupled in some units. You've got already got you know one in six of the population waiting for a hospital uh, appointment. Now, obviously, the healthcare system will be put on a war footing, if you like, to deal with this uh, this particular crisis. But you know the point about capacity, which Pat makes, is, is absolutely crucial. And I mean, if you look at the statistics, Northern Ireland has one of the fewest. Um, per capita numbers or ratios of intensive care units uh, in Europe, um, considerably lower than Italy. And then you look at what the situation is there uh, at this moment in time, you know, that gives an indication of potentially how uh, catastrophic this could become if there is an urgent action to uh, to deal with that. And um, I mean, in terms of, of staffing, it's absolutely correct that, uh, you know, um, student Student nurses who are nearly qualified, uh, retired medical professionals should be given the option of uh, being becoming part of a part of the team to deal with this uh, crisis. But it's absolutely essential as well that in, in that they are given all the training and protection and so on and resources that they need in order to uh, protect them, but also protect uh, patients in the health system as well. I, I think also Daniel's absolutely right to highlight that. And I think one of the key issues we need to kind of also understand about why our health service is in such a state that it's in is that the reality is this is that our health service has been underfunded for a specific reason and certainly we would face it in our health service and see it more and more on a daily basis is actually the kind of underhanded privatization uh, ideology or approach that is being taken where we have unfortunately the private companies in healthcare coming in and, and, and actually siphoning off uh, millions and millions of pounds of money uh, out of our health service for them, for, for private companies to basically effectively exploit. And we have to look at that. That is, uh, that is a key issue here is privatization is a driving factor for, for Westminster, for the Tories, but, but again, also for Westminster, for, um, for assembly parties there, you know, whenever you, whenever we challenge the assembly parties through the union movement, uh, they're very clear that they don't see a problem with privatization within our health service in reality. Uh, and we are seeing that uh, with the current reviews and, and reforms that are being imposed or wish to be imposed 
uh, over many years and, and the new reforms are coming. And privatisation and an insurance-based healthcare system is the driving ideology now for the mainstream political parties. And we, only, we don't have to look too far to see what that would mean for our health service in Northern Ireland, which in some regards has had some protection. The privatisation is there, it clearly is there, but it's in the main, it's, it's in some regards, it's, it's around the periphery, but it is eating more into the into the core of it. But if you look across the water at the at, at England, uh, particularly, you see massive privatisation on a scale that that, that is actually uh, is actually destroying the health service. I mean, one particular example would be uh, the Virgin Care, which would be Richard Branson's uh, 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 company, who is making billions of pounds of profit out of out of the health service. Uh, to to the extent in, in March 2019 uh, last year they had a, a, a operating profit of around 503 uh, million pounds you know so massive amounts of money and then has the audacity to sue the health service the NHS because he wasn't allowed to uh, tender a bid and 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 this is the the, the crazy. Uh, craziness of, of, of capitalism, of, of the tendering rules for business, is that business can then sue uh, effectively a government because, because they, they breach the kind of EU rules that allows them to tender, even though they, what they were tendering for was children's services, which they were going to be going to be given going to be uh, given better, or going to be uh, the provision of services is going to be far better because it was going to be within the health service, within the NHS, rather than within the private sector. And he was allowed then to, to take the NHS and won an undisclosed sum of money. Uh, from my understanding, it was in, in, in the rounds of millions of pounds. So this is the, this is the issue about the underlying uh, attack uh, is also uh, on our health service as well. And I think you're seeing that uh, with the growth of the private hospitals as well. Um, and then you and and the driving down obviously of wages. Uh, we've seen uh, obviously the last uh, industrial action there certainly in Northern Ireland, very successful industrial action, which had a positive step forward with with a with a step forward in relation to pay uh, that we've seen. It has been ongoing for years, and that itself also pushes workers out of the health service. It pushes actually qualified staff out of Northern Ireland because they look further afield, they look they look beyond Northern Ireland for better terms and conditions and better wages. And it also prevents people coming into the service, into the health service, because they go, well, why would I go into the health service to be paid the wages? Look what they look look what look what you have to do for that money. And why would I do that when I can when I can go and do something else? And I think that in itself is also a major problem why our health service is under is under major threat. Um, so I think you know we, we, we have to look at all these issues in the round, but there's very clear uh, issues in, re- in relation to why our health service. And one of the other, other key issues is agency work, agency workers. Um, agency workers are an easy, uh, uh, an easy group of workers that are exploited. They're exploited in the public sector. They're exploited for a couple of reasons, because they can be paid the, the least amount of money. Uh, the employer, which is our, which is the government, which is the health service, doesn't have to pay for annual leave, doesn't have to pay for pensions, doesn't have to pay, you know, sick leave. These are these are exploited works, and, and in some remo- in some places we have in areas over forty percent of our staff within our health service are agency workers. These are workers who are doing a great job, doing a crack job, uh, and doing the best job they can, but they but they haven't got a permanent uh, position, and that makes it very precarious for them for their life. For their families and, and 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 them trying to have a life, but it ha- and has a detrimental and then and itself has a detrimental impact on the health service itself because they don't know if they're going to be there from one week to the next. So these staff themselves, these agency workers, should be made permanent and should be and should be and, and should be looked after and should be taken in into into the health service uh, in the public service and on permanent contracts with obviously trade union terms and conditions. I think the, Pat, the point that Pat makes about ideology um, is actually extremely important here because what's been done to the NHS is is entirely ideological. It has obviously not worked. People have seen this for years now when we, um, you know, every single time there's a flu um, epidemic every Christmas, we see the hospitals really struggling. And it's consciously done because if you underfund and underfund and underfund our public services, then people will call out for privatisation. Um, and that, that is exactly what they've done. So I think it's the job of the trade unions now, actually, um, 
step up and protect staff. We need to fight against the privatisation, but but we also need to actually um, fight to make sure staff are protected during this. The the recent in, industrial action in the health service in, in, in January was was about safe staffing um, and the provision of services. Uh, and I think it is a major concern for most staff, and I think it's uh, an issue that they would get active on. Um, trade unions should be acting as, as a watchdog to ensure health and safety is guaranteed, that staff terms and conditions are protected and, and adequate resources are, are available for their protection. Um, and trade unions should organise a health and safety supervision team that would go around workplaces to oversee and ensure employers are protecting staff and patients. Because we, we've proven that we actually we can't trust our managers in situations like this. You have managers in hospitals who are, who are sending their staff uh, into dangerous areas with, with, with zero PPE. That is that is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I think that the point that Karis makes about the role that the trade unions need to play in this situation is uh, is very important. But just to touch on the question of privatisation, which uh, Pat dealt with. I mean, he, he mentioned. Richard Branson, a billionaire who has asked his staff in other businesses uh, to take eight weeks on paid leave while also seeking bailouts from the government uh, himself. But I mean, you know, we've seen kind of parasites, to be honest, like this being allowed to suck blood from the NHS uh, for years now because of the piecemeal privatisation of our health service. I think it's just it's crystal clear in this situation the need to bring the entirety of, of the health service and all resources that are available together to be able to deal with this crisis. And that means that we need to be calling for the uh, the nationalisation, the bringing into public ownership of private hospitals, of pharmaceutical firms, the question of Randox in Northern Ireland we might uh, touch on, uh, we might touch on later. Um, and that these need to be you know, uh, put to the best possible use in terms of uh, dealing with this crisis, but also that that, that shouldn't be reversed once this pandemic has yeah. gone away, whenever that happens. Uh, instead, you know, we need to fight to go back to the idea of a fully public, fully comprehensive NHS from cradle to grave, which is paid for through genuinely pr progressive taxation on precisely the likes of Richard Branson, on the billionaires, on the super rich and so on. I mean, the, the Tory government is talking about renting private uh, hospital beds and cost mm -hmm. of millions of pounds a day in order to deal, to deal with this. We, we would say that these, uh, these profiteers have made enough money from our health service the time for that is over and they should simply be requisitioned and br brought into public ownership. The same with uh, many other firms which are making uh, money off our NHS and whose resources are vital right now. Absolutely. The Tory government initially came forward with a strategy based on herd immunity, the idea that the coronavirus should be allowed to continue spreading in the hopes that a large chunk of the population would get the virus would recover from it and develop immunity. Scientists and medical professionals criticised this strategy, saying the government was moving too slowly and was behind what was really necessary, uh, that the strategy has risked lives and was based on spurious science. But more recently, the Tories have claimed that the science has now dramatically changed, first taking some limited measures in terms of closing pubs, cafes, restaurants and gyms, and later making moves towards a UK-wide lockdown. Has the government really been acting in the interests of public health? They've said all along that they'll do the right thing at the right time. What do you think they mean by that, Daniel? Well, I think it's clear that the primary concern of the Tory government, uh, as with all capitalist governments, has been safeguarding the profits of big business, and that has primarily regarded, uh, kind of guided their response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I think capitalist governments in general were initially slow to respond to the crisis with, you know, broad shutdowns and other measures to prevent contagion. But I think many also drew lessons from the experience of Italy, uh, where hesitation led to exponential spread of the virus and the horrific situation we're seeing today, which we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, with, with more dead than in China and a, a modern health system, which has been completely overwhelmed 
Um, so I think that a lot of governments have, have concluded that actually there, there is a need, even from the point of view of big business, to take urgent and dramatic steps in order to try to uh, prevent the, the spread of this contagion. Um, but the response of the Tories has lagged behind at every stage. And there are two quotes which I think give an insight into the psychology behind that. In 2006, Boris Johnson said that uh, in the film Jaws, which I'm sure most people have seen or are at least aware of, the mayor was the real hero because he resisted pressure to close the beaches because of its impact on uh, on local business, you know, while his constituents were being eaten by a by a giant shark. And meanwhile, Dominic Cummings, who is like really the power behind the throne of the Johnson government and a right wing eugenicist and sociopath, apparently put forward a strategy at a private event in February, which was summed up as herd immunity, protect the economy. If that means some pensioners die, too bad. In other words, allow the virus to spread quickly, take a short, sharp shock uh, with the aim of minimising the impact of the, on the economy, even if that means more fatalities. So I think that that shows that we're dealing with a particularly odious and reckless government in Westminster, even by capitalist standards. And it, that's what's guiding the actions of the Northern Ireland executive as well, uh, even with some belated opposition from uh, from Sinn Féin because of the, the kind of developing contradiction between the situation north and south in Ireland. But I think that the Tories, <laughs> even they underestimated the scale of the impact of that herd immunity strategy with the you know, Public Health England suggesting, for example, that 8 million people could require hospitalisation if it was allowed to run its course. And that could translate into hundreds of thousands of deaths. And I think that that caused a rethink and some of the measures in terms of sh limited shutdowns, which uh, you mentioned, uh, Eleanor. I don't think that they're primarily concerned about the lives of ordinary people, but they understand that if they were to preside over just a catastrophic failure on a scale not seen in other countries, there would be political ramifications for that and that they could pay the price. And so th that's why they've moved in the direction of th those shutdowns as well as a, pack a package of economic measures, which are largely aimed at bailing out big business and, you know, for, for which the taxpayer, i.e. ordinary people, will be asked to show, shoulder the uh, the burden going forward. And that, But that's another question. But even now, some things are still lagging behind where they should be, uh, although we're expecting a new announcement of measures uh, from the, the government in the next uh, in the next while. I mean, as far as we're concerned, I mean, I think from the point of view of socialists, we would argue that at this point, all non-essential sectors should be shut down without loss of pay for the workers involved in order to spread the slow of the virus and, and if you like, to, to flatten the curve as the, the term that's being used. The issue really is that I think it's the behaviour of the Tory government is completely abhorrent, you know, and, and their callousness just is beyond measure in how they've approached this. And that they have elevated in reality uh, the the profits of big business uh, above above human uh, human life is just is beyond the pale. And I think one of the key aspects of it as well is here, and, and I think you're it's correct to say that while they're dragging their feet in, in implementing measure, but even there recently, even in Northern Ireland, we're seeing uh, Robin Swan, who has also said, unless we get on top of this quickly. You know, 80% of people get it in Northern Ireland. You're talking, estimating uh, around 14,000, 15,000 people possibly could lose their lives. If 50% of people get it, then we could be down to nine or 10,000. And obviously, these are estimates and, and figures coming, how they're working them out on the statistical model. But even to fathom that and, and to, to countenance that without actually saying, this is, you know, we need to get on top of this now and provide every, every measure that prevents any de any deaths at all is beyond is beyond understanding the approach in relation also to workers indicates the t the tory approach measures are being uh, implemented in northern ireland where we're seeing workers also being just cast aside even within the public sector within our health service as i said previously is that we have agency workers who are who are under threat now? There is promises now that, that those agency workers will be protected uh, in relation to their jobs and their wages, but that wasn't guaranteed. That only became an issue as pressure from below, from the actual agency workers themselves, who were who were raising these issues, and the threat that that was going to have on the assembly and, and on the Tories and through the trade unions as well as has played a role. But I would also say the trade union has to step up and play a further role to make sure. Uh, these uh, measures are implemented uh, to safeguard these jobs. 
I mean, I think this whole idea of, I mean, herd immunity is straight out of like Malthusian economics 101, the guy who literally justified you know, huge famines. So, I mean, I think it's very indicative of Tory policy generally when they say they'll do the right thing at the right time. They mean they'll do as little as possible um, up until the point where they're forced to. And, and they have been forced into action. Um, you know, 330 billion has been announced in, in business loans um, and there's a commitment to pay workers 80% of their wage. So they are under pressure. And, and I certainly think to continue to put pressure on the government and to, to deliver on some of these things. But I think it actually is really reflective of this kind of crisis of capitalism generally, you know, this absolute drive for short term profit, having zero eye to the future and what this might mean. You know, potentially losing a fifth of your workforce. I don't even know what that would mean for the economy, but it would be extremely serious. I, I think if the government were were serious about long-term economic growth, then of course they'd be shutting down workplaces. There, there are other examples of capitalist countries where they have taken more serious measures. Um, in, in Italy, for example, although obviously it was very delayed. South Korea, for example, um, have you know taken quite swift action. Um, They've done mass testing and, and, and there's been you know proper coordinated action for, for isolated people and to be able to, to halt the spread of the disease. So these states are certainly capable of acting on the issue, but it's, it's about having the political will to do so. I think the issue of testing, which Karis has raised, is really, really important. I mean, the message coming from the World Health Organization is test, test, test. You know, health professionals are saying that, that is the key way to kind of get ahead of the spread of this virus so that you can more effectively target containment and uh, treatment measures as well. But I mean, what's happening in Britain and in Northern Ireland is extremely limited. I mean, they're talking about ramping up to 800 tests a day in Northern Ireland, but that is way below what is necessary. Locally, we have, I think, two companies, but but certainly one, uh, Randox, which has the capability of producing testing kits. They are producing them. They are exporting them all over the world. Obviously, they're doing so for a profit. I think that they're being sold for something like £300 uh, a go, which I'm sure there's a big profit margin built into. This is a company, by the way, which received millions of pounds in public sector support in terms of its uh, setup and uh, and research. I mean, for, from a socialist point of view, it's just ABC, the companies like Randox should be brought into public ownership, along with the pharmaceutical uh, sector as a whole, and that those resources should be, should be used to facilitate the production of tests on a not-for-profit basis in order to facilitate mass testing, both locally but abroad as well. Something that stands out in this discussion, as well as the chronic underfunding of the health service, is the role that the capitalist system has played in terms of this crisis, with the pursuit of profit being very much at odds with what is actually needed in society right now to stop the spread of the virus and to save thousands of lives. My question is, what's the alternative and what concretely can be done to achieve it? Well, I think it's important to note that if we didn't live under capitalism, um, the coronavirus wouldn't have sparked anywhere near as much of a crisis as it has. If we were living in a socialist society, a serious and coordinated international response would have started the minute concerns were raised in Wuhan and they would have isolated cases and provided all of the medical equipment necessary. Decisions would be made on the basis of need and not profit and therefore we can shut down an entire economy if necessary and you would get support from elsewhere in the world. If factories were under genuine workers' democracy, then we could completely shift production towards things like hand sanitizer and um, PPE for frontline staff. People would have been guaranteed full pay while self-isolating, rather than the ridiculous situation we're currently in, where workers are having to choose between potentially infecting their entire workplace and feeding their families and paying their rent. Now, obviously, our immediate demand should be focused on guaranteeing that enough staff and resources are made available to fight the virus. I mean, this requires undoing a decade of Tory austerity um, and the new Labour bureaucratisation prior to it, which left the NHS already at its knees. Um, so we need to demand an immediate injection of public funds to safely staff our hospitals. Another demand we should be put into the government is the mass testing of the population, especially health staff. You know, we need to be tracking this so we can help to isolate the virus. Um, there needs to be an immediate recruit recruitment drive for nursing and medical training um, on the basic wage of newly qualified staff to all students. 
so that they can actually commit to training without having to worry about how they're going to pay for this later. They're proposing a five grand bursary for new nursing students, which whilst welcome, that's actually not enough to recruit the huge new layer of staff that are going to be required to sustain the NHS during this crisis. And of course, this should be connected to the demand to scrap all tuition fees. The NHS was founded on the concept of having a socialised healthcare system after World War II. Um, and this came about because of huge pressure exerted by the working class and returning soldiers from war, where they demanded major social reforms. And the NHS will only be protected by working class people standing up and fighting for it. And, um, you know, against people like Virgin and Richard Branson. Principle of free access to, to health care at the point of need is, is something we need to protect, but it needs to go further than that. The NHS is entirely reliant on the whims of a privatised and, and at this point parasitic pharmaceuticals industry. Um, and in order for healthcare to be delivered effectively, the connected industries have to be brought into public ownership and control. So this includes construction, logistics and research. You know, um, Randock was brought up earlier. But this is not the Northern Irish company. They've created the testing kits for the virus and now they're shamefully profiting um, from this pandemic by grossly overcharging the NHS and other national healthcare systems in other countries. Um, Randolph should be immediately nationalised to ensure the cheap continued production of the tests. The wealth exists in abundance to fund a public healthcare system and it's simply being hoarded by the 1%. And in the immediate term, this needs to be heavily taxed in order to sustain the NHS, but also the huge crisis of capitalism, which we're about to face. Health workers having democratic control over hospitals would drastically increase their efficiency. The staff themselves have a much better idea of what is necessary for the running of their units than the NHS bureaucracy does. Um, actually, interestingly, during the SARS crisis, like vaccine research began into creating vaccines for similar strains of the virus, um, such as coronavirus. But the minute the crisis calmed down, they immediately abandoned research as it was no longer profitable. Um, under capitalism, research is done separately and in competition with other firms, whereas under socialism, knowledge would be shared with a view to furthering medical science and the well-being of humankind, not for profit. So to me, the, the need for democratic workers control over the NHS has, has never been greater. But, uh, I mean, obviously, all the points you made there, I absolutely agree with uh, completely. Um, I just want to obviously say from a healthcare perspective, a healthcare workers perspective, we would value mass testing uh, for the reasons that Karis has obviously indicated. Um, it protects not only us, but also reassure. It also makes sure that we are not carrying the virus into work or out of work back to our, our families and our local communities. Under a different, under a social society, under a, you know, under a society, we would we would certainly argue for would, that that would have been done automatically. The, the collectivization and uh, of ruling that out. Uh, and central planning of rolling that out in a social society would, would have been done immediately. I think in relation to our health service, clearly in, in, with all its problems, and nobody's saying it's perfect by any stretch of imagination because of the attacks that is that has had over many, many years, it is in itself still the envy of the world. It is still one of the best health services because of the socialised aspect of it, and it indicates what can be achieved. It shows what can be achieved. Uh, with even with let's be clear, our NHS isn't a socialist NHS by any stretch of the imagination. But within it, it clearly has elements and clearly has centrally part of it a, a socialist ethos, a socialist uh, a, a socialist idea uh, and principles built in. And, and Daniel has touched on that previously about uh, the principles being of universal, universally free access to all healthcare at the point of delivery, and that it's paid for through central funding. But obviously, we would go further than that and to say that it should be progressive taxation. The rich should be paying substantially more than what they're paying. Uh, looking back at the tax avoidance uh, uh, and, and tax evasion, the, the legal ta tax avoidance and tax evasion that is carried out uh, using uh, an array of accountants and tax lawyers that the rich have at their back and goal, that they can actually pay less tax than the average worker. And I mean, one of the examples of that was that last year alone, 9,000 of the UK's richest people, we're talking the mega rich, paid an average about 5 billion uh, uh, in tax, while they earned 33.7 billion in, in capital gains. When you work that out, they're paying an average tax rate of around 14%. 
when you look at the average worker and the average low paid worker earning 12,000 is paying 20% in tax. That shows you where the wealth is and that shows you what could be done with that wealth if it was if it was taken into the hands of people and used appropriately. I think that's extremely, extremely important. The issue around nationalisation is a fundamental issue for, for the public services and for certainly for health. We should be uh, nationalising the big pharmaceutical companies, the big industries that are directly connected to our health service. But there is an argument. I mean, when I started in the health service many, many years ago, we would have had in-house workers who would have done all the electrical work, all the painting work, all the industri- all that construction maintenance work would all have been done in-house, paid for by the health service, would have been employees of the health service. All that work has now been subcontracted out for thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. Those types of work, the construction, the maintenance, the logistics, the research, all needs to come back in-house. Because how are we supposed to keep control of it? How are we supposed, as, as a community, as a society, to keep that accountable if we don't have direct control and direct ownership of it? And that can only be done in a, in a, in a socialised, in a, in a socialist uh, health service, in a socialist society. Yeah, I mean, I think it's become very apparent the ways in which capitalism, in terms of its anarchic, profit-driven markets, the competition between different, uh, you know, national elites between different companies and so on, has been a block on the response to this uh, to this crisis. The lack of international cooperation has been extremely notable. Like you know, the lack of support for Italy, for example, from other. EU member states, you know, we're constantly told that the EU is a is about solidarity and support, but it's been distinctly uh, lacking in this uh, in this context. I mean, I, I think that even capitalist politicians have had to acknowledge that in a way. I mean, one of the key lines that we've heard from the Chancellor Rishi Sunak and was echoed by Arlene Foster is that this is not the time for ideology. And for me, what they mean by that is please ignore the fact that the logic of our you know, neoliberal ideology of free markets, unfettered and so on, is breaking down actually in the face of this crisis. And that we're having to do things that we told you were impossible. We're having to find money to invest in public services. We're having to you know, consider bringing key sectors of the economy into public ownership. And we're having to step in to rescue sectors of the uh, of the economy as uh, as well. I, I absolutely agree with the point that uh, people made about the pharmaceutical industry. But I mean, I suppose there's also an issue about the lack of ventilators, which I think was touched on earlier. And again, you have the Tory government meekly asking private industry, can they turn towards the production of ventilators? And effectively being told no in, in, the, in the broad sweep, I think. I mean, on the basis of a planned economy, that simply wouldn't be an issue. Like, you know, that you would divert all manufacturing capacity which is producing you know, items which are non-essential in the current context towards the production of ventilators and other equipment, which is immediately necessary to tackle this crisis. Just to give an example of how healthcare can be organised differently, we don't have time to go into it in detail now, but we wouldn't hold up so- uh, Cuba as a shining example of a, of a socialist utopia by any stretch of the imagination. But I mean, if you look at their healthcare system, which is one of the best in the world, delivers one of the highest life expectancies in the world in the context of a small, poor country, which is under blockade from its superpower neighbour. Uh, and it delivers that on the basis of a, a a planned, uh, a planned economy, uh, a uh, which allows more direct intervention, a more preventative focus in terms of, of improving people's health and preventing people from becoming ill, and they have developed a drug which is shown to be effective in terms of treating COVID-19 and they are making that uh, available. I suppose the point is if that could be achieved on the basis of a broadly planned economy in the context of Cuba, imagine what could be achieved on the basis of a planned economy on a global scale and with all the wealth and resources uh, which humanity has were were, uh, put to use in a planned and democratic way to meet the needs of ordinary people instead of the needs of a tiny super rich elite. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Pat and Karis. We want to hear from you. 
Find Socialist Party NI on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Socialist NI. For more news and analysis or to donate, go to socialistpartyni.org.